imported the weather from the end of July and brought you perfect weather for this time. So, This is a conference about call, and this is a place about call. This has been the home for the American Baptists since 1943. So for all the American Baptists who are here, welcome home. This has also been an ecumenical center since the beginning as a part of American Baptist tradition. And so for those of you coming from outside of the American Baptist family, welcome too. And the thing I want you to understand is that God can call people from in any place and in any venue that he chooses to do so. But historically, since 1943, he has disproportionately chosen to use these grounds as a place of call. And so, be particularly sensitive to what God can say. You've arrived at a dangerous place where God may have a message for you, um, and it, it may be rather tricky. So you could be an Englishman who all of a sudden ends up in a completely different mission field, or you could be going wherever. So be sensitive and open to that call, and enjoy this conference. Right before I end, I just want to introduce Sandra Wimpelberg, is a longtime American Baptist leader who's just joined our staff. So Sandra, welcome. And you'll have a chance to meet her too. So with that, I'll hand it over. Enjoy the conference. Thanks. Well, let's change accents a little bit, okay? How are y'all doing this morning? I'm Ray Scooter with International Ministries. I now work out of Valley Forge, but I'm from native Texas, if you can't tell already. And he isn't. He's from across the pond. So you know, we're so excited to be here, and we're so excited because so many of you have said, we want to be a part of what God is doing in international ministries and through the missionaries. We want to be privileged to partner with the missionaries in doing what God is doing around the world. Isn't that exciting? And we have some very generous donors who have come together and provided a matching gift. That means we're rolling out, it's in process now, of dollar per dollar match during some certain circumstances during till July the 31st. There's four ways you can give. We have about $300,000 now. We think that'll grow to $400,000. You double that, that's $800,000. I don't know how you do math, but in my world, that's a million dollars, right? We're going to have a million dollars for international ministries and the future of the work with international missionaries. Does that sound exciting? In your seat is a way to give. There's four ways in which you can give because it's all about what you feel discernment God wants you to do. You can give to new work, you can give to present missionaries, you can give to missionaries in general, or you can give where most needed, and we'll double that. You can give by cash or credit card or check. or There's all kinds of ways we'll take your money. But we must have your name and identification in order to double that amount. So be sure and fill that form out. We'll take the offering this evening. We're making you aware of this today, during the day, so you'll have time to look at it, pray about it, talk to your family members about it, and make your commitment this evening. Praise be to God, okay? Thank you so much. Amen. Mangalaba. That was the greeting that Adoniram Judson heard 200 years ago as he and Ann uh, stepped off the boat. Uh, and this is a, a time when we're celebrating that history, but this is not a history conference. This is a conference where we're looking forward to our third century of mission as this uh, community of uh, Baptists, as we seek to be in partnership with Christ and with Christ's people around the world in mission. And it's a different time than it was 200 years ago. And uh, we've learned a lot of lessons along the way, and some of that needs to be reflected in how we express ourselves in worship. Uh, we've often dealt with the issue of uh, gender-inclusive language in our hymns and, and worship, but one of the issues that comes to us as, uh, in terms of missions is a lot of our mission uh, terminology uh, was very militant and militaristic. And in this time, especially when when uh, we're, we're encountering the Muslim world uh, all the way from uh, Asia and Africa and the Middle East to my home of Hamtramck, Michigan, where 50% of the population is Muslim, and I can hear the call to prayer uh, in the morning. So we need to think missiologically about how we communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if we do it with militant language, we're putting up barriers. And the scriptures tell us not to put a stumbling block in people's way. And so we need to clean up our language to be more loving and inviting and lifting up 
the name of Jesus. And so we're going to be singing in just a few moments an old familiar hymn, but there are uh, new words, new ways uh, to express it. And so I hope that you will do this out of missiological passion and love for people that need to know about our Savior Jesus. My name is May Lee. I came to faith in Jesus and heard the call to support the work of my alma mater, Central Philippine University. Today I bring you greetings from the president of the university, Dr. Theodoro Robles. Allow me to read his letter. I heard the call and came to faith in Jesus. I live out my call by working at Central Philippine University, one of the biggest universities in the Philippines founded by the American Baptist missionaries in 1905. Central Philippine University is committed to providing exemplary Christian education to life or the acronym is EXCEL, and being responsive to the needs of total person and the world. We carry out a program of spiritual, intellectual, moral, scientific, technological, and cultural training, and allied studies under influences which strengthen Christian faith, build up character, and promote scholarship, research, and community service. Central Philippine University is thankful for your partnership in ministry, and we bring you greetings from Iloilo City, Philippines. Signed, Chidoro Robles, PhD, University President. Thank you. Good morning. It was 65 years ago, this January 28th at 9 a.m., when my parents, myself, and my brother boarded a plane along with 24 others in Shanghai, bound for Chongqing and eventually Chengdu, which was uh, to be my father's first mission assignment. This represented a lifetime passion and call that my father and my mother felt in going to the mission field. They stopped for refueling in uh, Hankow and approximately 90 miles west of Hankow the plane caught fire and crashed and everyone on board the plane but myself uh, was killed. In going through my father's papers I came across uh, his call uh, in applying for commissioning as an American Baptist missionary. My father wrote these words. I was born into a home where Christ was master. When I was nine, I was baptized and became a member of the church. When I was 13, being a royal ambassador, I went to state camp and there rededicated my life to the Christian ministry. I had felt a message that I knew I must tell others. It was during my college years that I first th seriously thought of mission work. During my senior year, under the impulse of the Amsterdam Youth Conference, I attended the North American Christian Youth Conference, which was held in Toronto. It was at this conference that I began to feel the pull upon my heart that I must become a foreign missionary. One whole night after T.J. Ku had spoken, I did not sleep, but I tried to forget it. I had planned too long for the ministry in this country. Already I had been student pastor for two years and I liked the work immensely. In the spring of that year, I was invited to serve on the board of directors of the student volunteer movement. 
My acceptance of this invitation, I believe, was God's way of making my decision crystallize. I became friends with missionaries and missionary enthusiasts of all denominations. In our retreats and in our meetings, it became all the more clear to me that if I were to obey God's voice speaking within me, I must dedicate my life to foreign missions. The final decision came in October of 1941, and from that time on, I have not so much as experienced one doubt but what I had made the decision God had led me to. In September 1942, I married Dorothy Flanders, a trained nurse who had spent 12 years also with a passion for mission. My whole life is filled with a passion to share Christ with others because I know that I have been guided to share his good news in China and because I am a life, lifelong Baptist believing in the Baptist principles and policies, I am asking the American Baptist Foreign Mission Society to appoint myself and my wife as missionaries to China. This past fall, I was blessed with the opportunity of returning to China for the first time in 65 years. I traveled with my wife Joyce and with Ben Chan, our area director, as well as a friend of Ben's from Hong Kong, Stanley Chow, who recorded uh, this, this trip. And we will be sharing more about this trip, about uh, the events leading up to the tragedy that occurred in a small city of Tianmen, in Chinese meaning gates of heaven, where the plane, uh, where the plane crashed. And, and uh, we, we will be sharing tomorrow uh, the story of the miracle. Because one of the questions that I had was, was this death in vain? Was this death in vain? And the answer came in this trip, in the miracle of what we found and discovered in China. The seeds that have been planted by so many missionaries in the early, early part of the 20th century had come alive. And the Church of Christ was exploding in China. And while in uh, China, we had the good opportunity to visit with, the, uh, from, with folk from the Chungnang Seminary in Wuhan. And we have invited Reverend Wang, uh, who is the principal of that seminary, to uh, come before us and lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for bringing all of us here to your present. We adore you. You are worthy to be worshiped and praised. You created heaven and earth. You created human beings. You give the salvation to the world through Jesus Christ who died on the cross. Lord, you love the world. You love us. Lord, we love you. Jesus is the only way for us. Lord, we ask you to continue to bless American Baptist church world mission Lord let us hear the call the call from you let us follow Jesus and to serve the Lord Lord I ask you to, to bless your servant who, who will share with us. And we ask the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts, touch our hearts, give us wisdom, give us strength, give us energy to serve you, to share gospel to the world. 
Let more people become your children. Lord, you are the Lord. You know our situation. You know everything. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May your name be glorified. May your peace, joy be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. When Ken went back to seminary to get his doctorate, Fuller Seminary was on to the church growth movement, and he was convinced that he would learn how to build the first Asian American megachurch. He would be the Chinese American Rick Warren. <laughs> During the 80s, he saw Evergreen Baptist Church of Los Angeles expand dramatically. But when he joined the board of, Inter of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship in 1990 and went to his first Urbana Missions Conference, Surrounded that week by 20,000 missions-minded college students and missionaries, he says that Urbana 1990 effectively destroyed his dreams of being the pastor of a comfortable middle-class mega church. He was hearing about a missional God he didn't know and hearing a gospel he didn't preach, one that didn't just save people from going to hell but also embraced the poor and pursued justice for all. Since then, God has captured his imagination to see the church become a picture and a preview of what God is doing in and for all of his creation. His dream today is not to build a megachurch, but to be part of Christ's revolution to bring his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Good morning, Green Lake. This is a great uh, privilege for me to be back here. I was last here in 2006 as the Bible teacher at the World Mission Conference. How many of you were here back then? Uh, if, you, if you were here with me, uh, we were all wearing these little round stickers. I think they were orange. It said 33% more. And uh, I, I asked, uh, what's going on with that? And they said, oh, well, uh, we're hitting a really uh, tough financial position right now with IM. And unless the churches give 33% more to uh, the world mission offering, we're going to have to start recalling missionaries. And uh, if you remember, I took my sticker off. Uh, not that I wasn't going to give 33% more, but I actually replaced it with 100%. And uh, you'll hear at the end of this message uh, just what God has been doing since 2006. Um, I was, as you heard in my introduction, I was already on the road to being missional, to being kingdom focused starting in 1990, but coming to Green Lake at the World Mission Conference reintroduced me personally as a senior pastor of our church to international ministries and to all of the missionaries that are part of that. And uh, it's been really, really an, an amazing journey for us as a church. Now, one of the things that I find very challenging pastoring a church in the United States is that as we send missionaries, my biggest fear is that they're going to come back and hate our church. You following me? Five years ago, we sent away two young adult women who had come to really uh, fervent conviction about the poor uh, through their university time as undergraduates, and we sent them off to Thailand. They're not through... Uh, our international ministries, but they were going to live among the poor in Thailand, learn the language, plant churches, and all of this. And I remember at the commissioning service, as I was laying hands on them, the spot was running through my mind is, if we don't continue to become radically missional as their church, when they come back in five years, they won't be able to stomach us. We have some retired missionaries in our church. Um, Dr. West and Dr. Cheryl Brown are uh, part of our church, as well as active ministry, missionaries. And uh, I love talking to the retired missionaries because they say, you know, 
it's, it's hard to admit this because we so, so appreciate all the local American Baptist churches that supported us for years and, let, and enabled our uh, missions to actually happen. But when we retire from the field and we come back to find a church, it's really tough because it feels like the churches that support us believe almost in a different gospel. Are you following me? Yeah. And so, so, so they're saying, you know, why is it that a few of us are sent and the rest of you get to do whatever you want? And I was thinking, it's kind of like when I was a kid, you know, if you wanted to be really mean to the one weird kid on your street, all the rest of us would say, let's go play hide and seek. And we let that kid hide and no one goes to find him. And he's sitting out there in some dark alley, some dark corner, just thinking he has the best, most clever hiding place. And after a while, it dawns on him that nobody's looking for him. And sometimes I think that that's how some of you missionaries feel. That we all agreed to play this game. And we're all supposed to go out. And then you're out there, and you feel like you're the only one in the game. Someone say amen to that. I think it is a travesty and a tragedy that every year, whether we put stickers on our name tags or not, that our missionaries do not feel the 100% support of every single Christian in our American Baptist churches. So in the three times that I have with us this week, I'm going to be presenting what God has been showing us at our church and how it is starting to revolutionize and radicalize every person in our church so that the missionaries don't feel like they're the only ones in the game. So I took the liberty of uh, retitling my messages, not just hear the call, but heed the call. I think a lot of us hear the call. The problem is we don't answer it. We don't pick up. We sing about the call. We pray about the call. We, we spend countless hours in Bible studies agreeing that that's the call. We hear the call, we just don't pick up. Now, this, this is a, a, a problem, actually, for me with my... I'm one of those uh, weird people that still have a landline phone. Uh, just kind of out of habit, I, I feel like I have to have it. The only people that call my landline phone, I'd say 95%, are people who want to remodel my house... Right? People who, who, from some school I graduated from that want me to donate. Right? Some, something, and so a lot of times I'm working at home and the phone's ringing and this is like goes against every instinct. I don't answer it. I hear the call. I don't heed it. Now, unfortunately, over the years, this has uh, caused my wife and me to teach our daughter, who's now 13, to lie. Okay? Now, this is not a good thing as a pastor's kid to be taught to lie, but this is the one area where we, we've just kind of unconsciously said, it's okay to lie. When she was three years old, and it was dinner time, and the phone would ring, and it'd still be some telemarketer, uh, a lot of times I would put her on the phone at three years old. <laughs> and, uh, you know, she's just happy to talk on the phone. She's like, I made potty today. It was great. They, 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 they put us on the do not call list. <laughs> but after my daughter was toilet trained, we, we trained her to, to lie. And so basically, she'll be standing right in front of me when she picks up the phone because she thinks it might be one of her friends, right? So she'll pick up the phone and she goes, Dad, it's for you. She goes, I'm sorry, my dad's not home. See, we have this problem. It's not like we have a hearing problem. We have an answering problem. And so even in our theme of hearing the call, the real problem is why don't we do anything about answering that call? Now, if you were with us uh, at the retreat over the weekend, I had a few moments to share a little bit about why I had such a hard time just hearing and answering God's call to be a pastor. And I share with you that, that for a lot of reasons, uh, it came down to my mom raised every one of us in our family to be president of the United States. 
And we were on that track, she made sure we didn't learn Chinese, made sure we didn't speak English with an accent or a southern accent. <laughs> or, or God forbid, a West Virginia accent. <laughs> but we ended up with this California accent. But uh, that didn't work out. There, there was a problem with my birth certificate. So anyway. I. I still was not going to be a president of the United States, so I went on to the kind of the default for Chinese families, if you're a male, especially back in those days, now it's, it's co-ed, but it's like, at least be a doctor. And so even though my mother brought me to our little first Chinese Baptist church in Sacramento ever since I was an infant, even before she was a Christian herself, a church that my paternal grandmother and grandfather were charter members of, through the ministry of American Baptist missionaries to them in China. Even though I was raised in that my entire life, I never once gave serious consideration to answering God's call to be a pastor because it conflicted with my own dreams. Right? I, I was raised with the American dream and then the Chinese version of that. Right? It's not, not only have a, you know, a, a profession, but have a profession that your parents could brag about to their friends. I don't know if that's limited to Chinese people. And it wasn't until I let go of that dream for a dream that was beyond my wildest imagination, something that only God could think of, about saving and changing the world in Jesus' name. And to do that by being something and someone that I had never imagined myself growing up to be, which is a pastor, that's when um, I began to be able to answer the call. Um, we're going to look at several texts this morning. The first one, and they're all very familiar, is, is Mark chapter 10, when Jesus encounters the rich young ruler. It says in verse 17, As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one's good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. And you can almost imagine this, this uh, young man's chest starting to swell with pride because he feels like he gets 100% on this test. And he says, teacher, all these things I have kept since I was a boy. And Jesus looked at him and loved him. Now one of the things that I want us not to to overlook is that what comes next out of Jesus' mouth is motivated by what? Love. Love. Now, when we really don't know this Jesus and we read what he says next, we can mistake what he says as cruel, right? You just raise the bar so high that nobody can jump over it. But what in the world is going on when Jesus is saying, I'm looking at you right here, and I'm looking at someone who his, his own self-concept is, I'm doing a great job. I'm doing terrific. I'm moral. I'm righteous. I'm law-abiding. Right? I'm, I'm seen by most people around me as someone who is really a strict and, and faithful follower of God. And yet Jesus looks at him and sees something else. Okay? And so... We need to understand that what is, a, is going to come next from Jesus is motivated 100% out of love for this person, saying, I love you so much that I can't just leave you thinking that. Okay, so here's, here's what comes next. One thing you lack, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. The problem that this man had is a problem that most of us in the church have, that many times those who are missionaries and who have actually gone to the mission field don't have as much a problem with. And simply this, and I say simply as, as an understatement. We have come to understand being a Christian, being a faithful follower of Jesus Christ, really comes down to sin management. Sin management. Did I sin today compared to yesterday? Right? And if I'm doing a pretty, really good job at managing sin, 
then I must be right with God. And so people just, they've kind of reduced it all down to that. And that sin is defined as immorality. So if I'm not, I'm not in any kind of blatant, obvious way being immoral, then I must not be sinning. And like that young man, we start congratulating ourselves like, hey, I'm doing awesome. One of the things that we've been doing at our church is we've been revisiting what is sin. And we say, guess what? Go all the way back to the garden. Eating a piece of fruit is not immoral. So it can't just be the action. It was the attitude that motivated the disobedience. And what is that? It's not trusting God. God says, I'm going to take care of all your needs, everything you need and want. It's, it's a done deal because I love you. Same motivation. And as soon as God is out of eyesight, Adam and Eve go, you know what? I'm not feeling that so much. <laughs> so if, I, if you and I just do this, then we'll be cool. Then, then we'll have it all together. Why is it that Martin Luther said the worst sin is good works? Just like this rich young ruler where we fill ourselves so much with our own self-righteousness that we actually don't feel a desperate, desperate need for Jesus on the cross anymore. And the longer that we are Christians, the more pharisaical we become about what this is all about. Discipleship, following Jesus Christ, is so much, much more than sin management. Because Jesus loves us, He's not going to leave us to our own concepts of what life following him is all about. Life following Jesus is so much more than just leading a respectable, law-abiding, upstanding, moral life. He has called us all, not just the missionaries, to join his revolution of justice, healing, and hope. When we choose to follow Jesus, we've signed up for the Rebel Alliance. And even if we don't cross the ocean, we still are part of that revolution. And because we have this dichotomy, because that is present, that's why you missionaries feel like you're always never, you're, you're never fully supported, not just financially, but, but even in thought and in attitude and in prayer, it's because we have allowed two different gospels to exist in people's minds. This is the gospel that we preach and proclaim. That all of us have been cursed by sin, and those who come to faith in Christ are saved by his grace. This is the gospel that has been proclaimed for, for decades, if not centuries. This is what has brought many of us to faith in Christ. But this gospel is not the whole story. And many of us in church, armed with this, what I consider to be a truncated form of the gospel, this is the gospel that doesn't send us. This is the gospel that doesn't make us go. Why doesn't this gospel story send everyone? It's because it's missing the beginning and the end of the story. It's the middle of the book. How, what book can we read if we don't read how it starts and how the story ends? Does the middle make sense? Makes no sense. We need the full gospel, which I believe, simply put, has four chapters, not two. So it actually starts not with the fall, it starts with creation. And then it doesn't end with redemption in Jesus Christ. It ends by going out together in the name of Jesus to heal the world and to bring his justice, to be part of this revolution. Now, I would offer to you that all of our missionaries in the room here this morning, this is the gospel that they believe. They believe that it starts that every human being is made in the image of God and therefore has innate worth and value and enough to go and to spend your life uh, to be with them and to learn their language and to embrace their culture and ultimately, hopefully, to usher in a, a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. But it doesn't end there because those people, too, 
are now signed up to be part of the coming of the kingdom of God on earth in their context, or maybe themselves to cross borders and boundaries and oceans to go into another place. This four-chapter gospel is the missional gospel. And when we only tell the two-chapter version, it leaves people fine the way they are. And there's nothing to answer, nowhere to go. One of the things that uh, I want you to, to pay attention to is this, this more unabridged, robust gospel is bookended by God's shalom. So it says, hey, in God's story, he created everything to be in shalom relationship. First of all, all of creation was in shalom with God himself, their creator. And then all human beings made in God's image were in shalom with one another. No racism, no prejudice, no classism, no sexism. And on top of that, even all human beings were in shalom relationship with the rest of creation. There was no uh, pollution. There was no making species extinct and, and all of that kind of stuff. All of that was part of God's original intention. You have to know how the story began to appreciate how terribly wrong it all went in the second chapter and how desperately we needed Jesus to come in the third chapter to begin the process of God reinvesting his shalom so that in the fourth chapter we can look forward to the new heaven and the new earth where all of those broken relationships are restored. And how even if this does not happen in my lifetime and in your lifetime, every single one of our churches needs to be a picture and a preview of God's kingdom coming on earth as it is in heaven. One of the greatest witnesses that we fail to have is that we can take a skeptical person today and say, you know what, before I even preach the gospel to you, come visit our church and see the kingdom of God coming on earth as it is in heaven. And it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be complete. But you should see signs of supernatural activity that can't be accounted for because people are nice. We have, we have a guy in our church. We just ordained him. He's now an American Baptist minister. He's, uh, he's my first Mexican-European former convict. You know, uncle started the Hells Angels staff member. And when he first joined our church as a member, uh, there was a lot of Asian people that were intimidated by him. He's a big dude. He's a golden gloves boxer, black belt in karate. He was a bouncer at nightclubs. I mean, very different lifestyle than most of us. But as they came to know him as a brother in Christ, because of this gospel that has four chapters, we began to see the walls of hostility between him and other people start to crumble. And one of the greatest things uh, I used to watch is we had this... Um, uh, female doctor in our church is Chinese. I knew the church that she went to in Sacramento. It was one of those independent fundamental Bible churches, and she's all a four foot ten. And he's about six foot two, about 300 pounds. And uh, he became her pastor. And when she was studying for her medical board, she'd be sitting there in her office next to pastor. Well, he wasn't pastor then, but Steve, right? And he'd be prepping his Bible study. I'd walk by and wait to get some water and think, that's the lion with the lamb. Hallelujah. I go, I'm not sure which one's the lion and which one's the lamb. <laughs> because even though she's only four foot ten, he's as intimidated by her level of education and the car that she drives as she is by his background and his, and his physical size and prowess. And for them to be brother and sister in Christ and for her to submit to him now as her pastor and her counselor, she calls him like every day. For, for support and advice. I'm thinking only Jesus could do this, right? And so when I invite people to come to our church, take a look at that. There's all kinds of examples of that going on. We can't take credit for that. We don't know how to do that. The unabridged gospel is a story about God's love for the nations and God's global purposes. Genesis uh, 12, 1, we, we heard about this uh, uh, at the retreat, but it says that the Lord had said to Abram, go, from your country and your people and your father's household to the land I will show you, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse you and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Very familiar passage, the call of Abram. But what I want you to see is right from the beginning when God began to assemble the people of God, 
there was this commandment that as I bless you, you don't get to stay, you have to go. Because I'm, I gotta start somewhere. I'm gonna start with you and your wife, and it seems ridiculous. I'm gonna bless all the nations through you, and you don't even have kids right now, and you're pretty old. But that's my problem. Trust me. What is sin? Not trusting God enough. Okay? So I think one of, the, one of the essential things that has to happen to our churches so that we don't have an annual problem of our missionaries not having enough support, even, even worrying five seconds about whether they're going to be able to go back on the mission field, is we in the church need to be captured by the missional heart of God. We need to have the same version of the gospel that our missionaries have that have sent them. And we say, well, gosh, God, you know, if I'm not called to go yet, I definitely have to make sure that the people who, who have answered your call are going, I'm answering it my own way. I'm praying for them. I'm supporting them. This is a joint effort. But unless we let go of what our dreams are, unless, unless we let go of the things that we need, we think we need to feel secure, we won't go. We won't become those churches. God called Abram to leave behind what was comfortable, familiar, predictable, and established, and instead to move toward what was unknown, unthinkable, unimaginable, and unformed. Now, if that doesn't describe when, what missionaries are, are faced with, uh, I don't know what does. And again, when we have this dichotomy, I mean, go, yeah, you know, that's, that's true for missionaries, but that's not true for those of us who stay in our churches that we're called to the comfortable and the predictable. And it's just like, no, no, the choice to follow Jesus is to actually leave behind all of those kind of things. Now, what sane person would actually choose this? Okay? So, so I'll go on record right now. If you're a missionary in this room, you're insane. You're crazy. But all of us should be verifiably crazy. Why was Abram crazy enough to heed God's call? God said, I will bless you and you will be a blessing. And then all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. It's simply because he says, what do I do with all this blessing from you, God? This is more than enough. This is more than I need. I have so much abundance. I've got to share it. Okay. And so that's where he goes and goes out. Well, we have been abundantly, exceedingly blessed already by God in... Jesus Christ. If you're waiting for more blessing, take another look. God can't give us more blessing than he has already done in giving us his son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins. He can't give us more blessing than giving us and pouring out his Holy Spirit, the same spirit that indwelled Christ so that we can be part of this revolution. He can't give us more blessing than to invite us as imperfect and as ordinary as we are to join him in bringing more of his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. There is no greater blessing than that. Now, after all this time, all these centuries, it's the same God. It's the same call. It's the same huge planet. In Genesis 1, he had told us that uh, after I bless the man and the woman, I'm calling them to fill the earth and to subdue it. Matthew 28 talks about going and making disciples, sharing it to all these people groups and Acts 1.8 says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Throughout the Bible, there is this sense of redemptive movement. There is a sense that when God blesses a people and a person, it is not just to keep it for yourself and to hoard it, but it is to say, this is something that's so good, it's too good for me to keep for myself. What happened in Jerusalem? I know we're approaching Pentecost Sunday. What happened in Jerusalem unlike Las Vegas, was not supposed to stay in Jerusalem. <laughs> he says, you're going to take it from Jerusalem and then to Judea and then to Samaria and then to the ends of the earth. There's always been this movement. So heeding God's call meant choosing to be increasingly uncomfortable and increasingly more dependent on God. There is supposed to be this, this progress, this, con this continuum. So if you stay home in Jerusalem... Imagine the, those first disciples filled with the Holy Spirit. If they stayed home in Jerusalem just ministering to fellow Jews within their own language and culture, it's just like, well, that's easy. That's comfortable. There's no place like home. Well, okay, start there. 
but you don't get to stay there. Now you've got to go out to Samaria. These are people that are half Jewish, and they view you as a missionary, as someone who is oh, one who has oppressed them and hated them and, and been racist against them. Now it's getting a little uncomfortable. How are we going to do this, God? We've got to depend on you. And now we're going to go to Ethiopia, and we're going to go all the way to the ends of the earth, and now we're in completely unfamiliar places, different languages, people, cultures, and conditions. All of this is part of God's plan, not just for the people that he wants us to bring his blessing to. Now listen to this. But we will continue to be blessed as we are forced to be more dependent upon God and not on ourselves. The more self-reliant we are, the less we have to lean on Christ. Now, churches that proclaim a revolutionary gospel will also become increasingly mission-focused. So many churches are institu into institutional perpetuation. That's their mission, that we're still here. I got news for us. Every church described in the New Testament ain't here anymore. So what gives any of our churches the idea that we're supposed to be around until Jesus comes again? That's not the point. I was called back to my church in Sacramento for the 135th anniversary, and uh, this church is, is, I don't know if it's a typical American Baptist church, there's less than 40 people, uh, faithful little Chinese-speaking ladies, and, and uh, you know, a few English-speaking people, and all these people that used to be there uh, especially when I was growing up, they all came back for the 135th anniversary. The sanctuary was packed. It hasn't been like that in decades. And it's kind of one of those weird anniversaries. You know what I'm talking about? Where everyone's like, yeah, yay God, you know, 135 years, yay. And then it's like, we know that as soon as the reception's over and all the trash is put out, it's like 90% of those people aren't coming back next week. And I love that pastor who's there. He helped, he helped pastor my mom through her illness and, and he presided over her funeral. I mean, he really blessed our family. And I know he really struggles with this. And I said, James, l let, me, let me tell you something, man. You don't have to try to be a mega church. You, you don't have to try to be some so, so amazingly popular and successful church. Just be the church. There are people on the street that don't know a thing about you. And go out and knock on doors with no intention of any of them coming and helping pay the electric bill. But just love them because they're your neighbors. And if you die in the process as a church, but you die in the process of being the church and loving your neighbor and living out the gospel, what a great death. Rather than huddled in, in fear and just wondering if you're going to still be around next week, I go... We are the people that face death differently. But once you get past institutional perpetuation, you get into local missional partnerships. And you begin to look around, and you see plenty of opportunities in the community around us to actually be and bring the gospel. But ultimately, it means an increase in praying and sending and going, sacrificial giving and partnering with missionaries and agencies. And this is a part of the DNA of missional revolutionaries. And this is the process that God's been taking our church through, uh, especially uh, since 2006 when I was last here. Let me read you this quote from John Stott. Now we are Abraham's seed by faith, and the earth's families will be blessed only if we go to them with the gospel. That is God's plain purpose. We need to become global Christians with a global vision, for we have a global God. And when we think that we in the church who aren't sent overseas somehow have a different God, we have it completely wrong. Now remember what I told you, what's wrong with this gospel story that only has a second and a third chapter is it's missing the beginning and the end. It's taken completely out of context. It is not a missional gospel. And so the gospel that inspires and send us, sends us actually has four chapters. And I'll get more into this uh, in the next uh, lesson. But let me just say that the first chapter is that we were all designed for good by God. And then we were damaged by evil. That's when sin entered the picture. But when Jesus came to earth, he actually restored us for the better. But it doesn't end there. We are sent together by the same Jesus to bring his healing and his justice to the world. 
The life of the Christian after we pray the prayer of repentance is lived between chapter 3 and chapter 4. And at our church, we have taken to calling this the hero's journey. Now, if you're familiar with Joseph Campbell and the work that he did on myth and story, his research showed that every people around the world throughout history have all had this story motif in their, in their stories. And this is simply it. The hero's journey is where ordinary people, even in spite of themselves, in spite of how ordinary, in spite of their self-doubts, they wake up to this disturbing awareness that there's this great evil out there, there's this great need, and someone's got to do something about it. And, and that the whole struggle, well, not, certainly not me, I'm a hobbit. I mean, what, what, what in the world could I do, right, to, to fight this great evil? But it gets so, so unbearable that finally they get out of the shire and they go off on the hero's journey and they face all kinds of challenges and dangers along the way. Now, here's the interesting thing, folks. My experience of the hero's journey as a disciple of Jesus Christ is that God uses the world as much to save me as he's using me to save the world. Someone say amen to that. Amen. You know what? You, when you go off on this hero's journey and you know that you're unarmed, right, and outnumbered, you end up making fellowship of the ring, right? You, you end up making friendships and partnerships with people that you wouldn't have hung out with in high school. You know what I'm talking about, right? All of a sudden you go, you know, I don't care that you're a dwarf. You know, I, I, don't, I don't care that you're an elf. It's like, I need what you got. I can't do this by myself. And you begin to, all these issues of racial reconciliation and ecumenism, all these things become natural when you're actually on the hero's journey. Because you realize that you cannot do this by yourself. And even if you die in the process, this is now what you are all about. While the life of faith will never be safe, it can be secure. Faith may lead us into all kinds of dangers, physical, intellectual, and spiritual, but it simultaneously gives that sense of meaning and purpose to life that is the groundwork of security. I do not expect to leave this life with all my doubts resolved. I do hope to leave it in good standing with him from whom all meaning flows. Great book, Myth of Certainty by Daniel Taylor. I mean, the point here is simply this. When you go off on this hero's journey, there's, there's still doubts. You're still wondering, how in the world did I hear God right? And, and certainly, what can I add to, to actually bringing light into this darkness? I don't know that that ever ends. But for, but for me and for our church, it's like, but I know north is that way. I, I know that life is that way. And that in order to go that way, I have to lay down the life that I've been clinging to to actually go towards a life that really means something and matters. Um, so four chapter gospel, hero's journey. 2006, I'll end with this. 2006, I promised that I would go back to my church and I would challenge us to give 100% more than what we had given. Now the problem was I didn't know much how much we had given the year before. <laughs> so I talked big, right? So, so I went back to my bookkeeper and I said, how much did we give to the World Mission Offering last year? And she looked in her record and she said, $1,700. I said, okay, that's, I think we could double that. So we really started promoting that. We brought Jill, she was happened to be in town. She, she came, so that helped. That year, we collected $35,000 for the World Mission Offering. Yeah. Now, I was waiting for, you know, Charles Jones was the acting director. I was waiting for him to call me up. So what sermon did you preach? Because we want to duplicate that sermon, and we want to send it out to all of our American Baptist churches. I said, no, you don't understand. It's not a sermon. It's the gospel. You don't understand. It's what's taken hold of me, the senior pastor, as I have begun to really get, hear the call and heed the call and to realize the part that I play, even though I'm here and not over there, that the people who are called to be over there, they need me to do my part. Since that time, we've been, I've been to Congo. Our people have been in the mission field. These are um, four of the... Uh, the couples that we support in our uh, outside the world mission offering, they're also in our budget, but it hasn't ended there for our church. We support InterVarsity campus work in, in Los Angeles. We're on major campuses. 
Um, they're doing missional work. That's amazing. And they oftentimes do not feel supported by their local churches. Uh, we now have missionaries in Thailand, like I said, working with the very poor. We also have one in Brazil who's teaching seminary and working in hunger programs. And there are three missional priorities now that are, that are right in front of us as a church. One is to help homeless families. We formed a family promise network with 12 other uh, faith communities in the San Gabriel Valley, and we've now been taking in entire families, getting them better housing, better jobs, and they're now getting off the streets, and it's really exciting. Um, we, we, uh, we also are part of Eden Reforestation, which plants a tree for 10 cents. They're planting a million trees a month now. And uh, it's, it's amazing. Our entire Sunday school offering goes to Eden Reforestation. 40% of every dime employs poor people in the area who are AIDS orphans and AIDS widows. They have cash economies. Now, guess what, folks? In, in Ethiopia and Madagascar, where they have planted these trees, these people have built their own schools. They're not waiting for us to do it. They have, they have the money now. Okay? It's, it's really exciting. Two entire Muslim villages have converted to Christianity because they see the Psalms coming to life on their mountains, right? And they say, who is this that inspires you to do this? And they say, well, it's this Jesus. And they said, we're gonna, we're gonna start believing in that Jesus. And the last thing that's happening, and you'll hear more about this tomorrow, is we've been sending teams to Northeast Japan after the tsunami. And there's been some amazing stuff happening there. And we're teaming up with some of the Baptist churches in Japan. And uh, it's really exciting for us. I'm gonna tell you the miracle story uh, before I go. Um, not today, but um, be before I finish with you, that what God is doing there, there are non-Christians planting a church. Okay, I'll just leave you with that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. So, so I just want to leave you. It's, it's one gospel with four chapters. And it's a gospel that starts with God's shalom and the worth of everyone, worth our going to them and loving them and bringing them Jesus. And it requires all all Christians to be involved in this. I hope you're with me for the rest of this journey. Tomorrow we're going to talk about the cost of making this choice to follow, follow Christ, but this is what we should all be about. God bless you. Thanks. You know, I don't think... Uh... The Green Lake uh, Dining Hall is going to need much business today because we've been given a lot to chew on and to digest. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Uh, I don't know about you, but the phone is ringing, and uh, God's got a revolutionary message, and, uh, and, and I hope that you're picking it up right now. You've been picking it up. You've been listening to the message. Well, there's uh, uh, some uh, very detailed uh, instructions that are coming. And if you attend one of those workshops, maybe God is going to be uh, giving you some instructions about how you can act out uh, on, uh, as, as you're part of this revolution that uh, God's calling us to. So uh, take a little bit of a break to, to kind of inhale and uh, connect with some folks, but then we urge you to go uh, check out the workshop that the Spirit of God is calling you to attend. God bless you.